Hallelujah. That is something else. That is so good, you guys. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That is just awesome. And he does. And I love that, boy, that part of that song. Well, every bit of it is great. But the, that even when you don't see it, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Let me tell you how to pray for, for, uh, for people. I know everybody wonders, you know, wh- how do miracle prayers happen? I mean, what, what do you do? You, you, do you, are they, can you talk God into something? Is it miraculous because you finally figured out the right thing to say? Like God's, you know, he's, he's waiting. He said, no, not quite got it. Uh, you, you, need, you need to work on that sentence right there just a little bit more and then I can do a miracle. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Look, and God loves you. And, and look, don't let the devil whisper in your ear in these times of hardship that God doesn't care about you and that God doesn't love you, or if you'd straighten your act up, God would get with you. He loves you when your act is not straightened up. He loves you when you were as sorry as you could possibly be. When you were rebelling against him and cursing and doing everything you could possibly imagine against the kingdom of God, he still loved you anyway. He loved you just as much then as he does now. I mean, we don't earn love from God. God gives us love. And that's what he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I love, you love me because I first loved you. And so here's what you say to God. Here, here was his prayer miracle. Uh, all four of us. Now, l- let me just mention this. If you're praying for someone, like a grandchild or a child or a cousin or something, if you're praying for a family member or somebody that you know, the person who is the authority over them needs to be in the prayer group. And in, in other words, if it's a father, I don't care if they're divorced. I don't care. You know, they may be 40 years old. God hold, uh, I'm the father of my children. And until my children become parents themselves and, and represent their own family and their own household and all that, God still holds me responsible for, my, for them. I don't care if they're 50 years old. I mean, I'm the one that he's looking at as the authority. Now, when they get their own family and they start their own family and have their own children and all that, then they become their own unit. But, but until then, God holds me accountable. So I, we're going to pray for a teenager, let's just say. You got a teenage grandchild or something. Get their parents or get, it, get their dad. That, that's the only one you need. Get their dad. I don't care. He can be living somewhere else. He's not even with the family. He's just divorced or whatever it might be. Get him. Get him in the group. Get in there. Hold hands. You don't have to hold hands, but it, it kind of symbolizes some things. Helps out a little bit, <clears throat> and you just and you get get right here, and then and then you say, you say, Father, this is a mess we're in when we're praying for our beautiful granddaughter, and and Lord, we've done everything that we know to do. We can't think of anything. We can't do anything. We are at the end of ourselves. We sh- we 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 repent for not coming to you first, but Father. You need to do something about this. Daddy, we're dependent. Daddy, can you handle this? Can you do this for us? Because we can't do it. We need you to do it, Daddy. Would you do it for us? And we agree in Jesus' name. Amen. And then walk away. And then watch what God does. And I'm telling you, it won't be long either. He is something else, man. That's what Hebrews 4.16 means. Where it says, come boldly unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He says, when you come to my throne, you're coming to a throne of grace. You're not coming to a throne of judgment. Don't think you're going to walk in here and the first thing I'm going to say is, get that hat off your head. This is a throne of grace. Yeah. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. If God gave us what we did deserve, we would be in hell right now. Yeah, buddy. We would have no stake in heaven because yeah, yeah. we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Yeah. It, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Right. Right. And so we come to a throne of grace 
And he says, come boldly. That doesn't mean brashly or arrogantly. It means telling all. It means freedom of speech, freedom of openness. God said, when you come to me, you just come in telling me everything. Because don't think there's nothing, there's anything that I don't already know. So you don't have to be gentle with me. You can tell me, you tell me if you're afraid. You tell me if you're in trouble. You tell me if it's an addiction. You tell me, you just tell me everything. And I will give mercy and grace before it's too late. That's literally what that verse means. In time of need means before it's too late. And that's what, because, and the verse before that says, because we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Yeah. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Because we have a high priest that knows how we feel. He's been where we are. We don't have to hide anything. He knows what it means to be afraid, to be fearful, yeah. to, be, to be beaten down, to be depressed. To be, he, he was tempted in every way like we are. Every way. Every way. And yet he didn't sin and he passed into heaven. And so we can come boldly. We don't have to fear this. And lay it down and say, Daddy, you do it. It's yours. It's your daddy. Help, help, daddy. I mean, what would you do if your child came and jumped on your lap and said, Daddy, daddy, help me, daddy. What would you do? Daddy, you would help, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Whatever it is, is <laughs> to get a load of you. That's all I'm saying. Well, God's our heavenly father. He said, call me Abba. When you come in my presence, say, Papa, Daddy, like a little child would. Man, our trouble is we're just too sophisticated. Our trouble is we come asking God to bless our plan. God, help me to talk to them about so-and-so. No, no, no. You might not even need to talk to them about something. That's probably the problem right there. You're trying to figure out some way to talk God into doing your plan. Look, God is always working around us. He invites us to join him. We don't wake up every day saying, okay, God, what can I do for you today? You say, God, what are you doing that you want me to be involved in today? Let me see it. Invite me and I'll be there. And the reason he lets you see it is because he's inviting you. Don't think that he shows you something and that's not an invitation for you to join him. That's the only reason he shows you. Why would he need to show you anything if, that's not, if he's not inviting you to get with him? Yeah. That's right, use me. Now, that's not any of the message. So I, <laughs> can I redeem a little of my time? All right. Now, that, that's really a message, but it's not this one. Oh, all right. We've been talking about pride out of the book of Daniel. I don't know why the Lord has me talking about pride so much. I guess I must be pretty proud. That must be, that must be it, really, pretty much. It must be talking to me about it because he just keeps hammering on this pride stuff. And I can tell you that I've had trouble with pride. All my life I've had trouble with pride. Uh, it, it shows up in very subtle ways, you know, really. Uh, it, it, it's not like you, you, you don't have to strut around like a peacock wanting everybody to worship you to be pride, prideful. Yeah. I mean, when, when you won't do something that you think is embarrassing to you, you know why you won't do it? Pride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know why some people sit in a church and never come down an aisle and confess Christ as Lord? Pride. Mm -hmm. Just too proud. They don't want anybody, I mean, to think of humbling themselves in the presence of others is just terrifying. You know what that is? It's pride. That's all it is. Pride keeps me shut up. Pride keeps me locked up. Pride keeps me from being humble. I can't be humble when I'm full of pride. Man, I'm the greatest. I can't. What are you talking about? Humble myself. Mm -mm. No. No, I'm not doing what you say. Man, it'll, get you, it'll mess your marriage up. You don't, you, don't, you don't care what your wife says about anything when you're full of pride. I mean, you're the smartest person in the world. You're the greatest. She's supposed to submit to you. That's what the Bible says, right? 
Yeah, the way you read it. Uh, but anyway, so that's we're on pride. And we, we're looking at the four, the four kings of Babylon that are perfect examples, perfect examples of what pride does in, in the life of a, of a believer. Because just remember this, God has sent Israel into captivity. God sent them in there. They, Nebuchadnezzar didn't take them, God sent them to him. And God allowed them to be taken by Nebuchadnezzar. And they're in there for 70 years because God has to teach them a lesson. He's not punishing them, he is, he is disciplining them, he is instructing them because they need it, they're, they're going to destroy themselves if he doesn't correct them. So he puts them in there for 70 years and they are in exile, is the word for it in the Bible, for 70 years. They had not allowed the land to rest one year for every seven years and they had been in their land 490 years. So they, one year for every year they stole from God, they went into captivity in Babylon and they, and they, were, uh, 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 they were under four pagan kings, heathens, uh -huh. reprobates. <laughs> I mean, hey, if you don't think God will use a heathen to correct you, you, you just got another thing. You need to read the Bible. I'm serious, man. God, God uses everybody. Yeah. God is a non-discriminatory user of, of everything. And anyway, he, he, so here they are under these four kings. And just when you look at these kings and you look at what happens in these six chapters of Daniel. Now, the last six are about prophecy and we're not getting into that. The first six are about this time they spent in exile under these four kings. And I've, I, I told you that each king represents a different area of pride that, will, that the devil tries to place into your life while God is correcting you, the devil is trying to destroy you. So while God is correcting you, he's trying to slip pride into you yeah. so that when the correction is over, you walk away from the correction with something in you that was probably worse than you got corrected for. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to introduce, and he, and, he, and he does it over and over. And you remember that last week was Nebuchadnezzar, we, the first four chapters of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he kept getting, pride just seduced him. He just kept getting drawn back into pride. And then he would proclaim God, and he'd get drawn back, proclaim, get drawn back. So Nebuchadnezzar represents the seduction of pride, which just means Pride is very seducing to us. It is very easy to be drawn into it. It's very tempting, it's alluring, it's, a, it's just a very, you have to pay attention to not be drawn into this kind of thing. And, because if you do, it's gonna destroy you. You remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, right? He got turned into the wild animal and for seven years ran and had the eagle feathers and all that. And, and then when he finally looked up to heaven again, God gave him, restored back his, his, his mind and everything. And, and the first thing he started doing is praising and extolling God. And just, I mean, he, he writes almost a whole chapter. Do you know that almost a whole chapter in your Bible is written by a pagan? by Nebuchadnezzar the king, because all it is is his prayer to God after he got delivered from all of that stuff. Well, after Nebuchadnezzar comes, and, and it, it, let me just mention this because it'll matter in some of these verses, comes his, comes his great-grandson, Belshazzar. Belshazzar is, he's called the king, but he's really not the king. He's really the crown prince. His father is the king. Nabonidus is his father. And Nabonidus is married to Nebuchadnezzar's granddaughter. I, go figure. As the world turns. But in the Bible and in cultural literature and in old uh, type uh, writings, the word father is used to represent any male ancestor. So, like God says, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, 
You got three fathers? No, you only have one. So what he's talking about is talking about your male ancestors. So Belshazzar is the king because Nabonidus loves to worship the, the moon god whose name is Sin. I mean, not really, that's, this real, that's the real name. Uh, and uh, that's a good, adequate name, right? And so he likes to go around and build these uh, temples to the moon god, Sin. So he's not ever around the kingdom anywhere. So he puts his son in charge, which is Belshazzar. And while he's gone, Belshazzar then becomes king. So Belshazzar's the one it's talking about in Daniel chapter five, and he's the one that does all this stuff. All right, so let's get in there and let's see. All right, Belshazzar's downfall was stubbornness. Any of you guys ever deal with stubbornness? Oh, yeah. You always wonder, where does this stubbornness come from? Why am I so stubborn? Somebody looks at you and says, you're the most stubborn person I've ever seen in my life. You have kids that are stubborn. Where does stubbornness come from? Well, Belshazzar's pride problem was stubbornness, and this stubbornness was caused by the pride in his life. Babylon, by the way, means um, uh, confusion. Uh, it comes from the Tower of Babel. You know, they tried to build a tower to reach God. God came down, uh, mixed up all the languages so they couldn't understand each other anymore. And, um, and, the, and, and you've, you've said it before. You just said, man, he's up there just babbling. He's just babbling on. Well, babbling means confusion. It's what the word, when you add the on, like Babylon, when you add the little on to it, on means sown, which, which not like sown with a needle, but sown like a seed. So Babylon means sown in confusion. I just, that's just a little free something for you, all right? Uh, all right, here we go. First verse, Daniel chapter five. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. Many, many people think that Babylon was a gigantic city of, in its day, about 200,000 people. I know you're thinking, man, 200,000 people, that's not a very big city. Well, think about the time now. Think about sanitation. Think about uh, food. Think about all the things that we take for granted and we can have big populations of people in small places, but they couldn't. But, but Babylon was the biggest city of the day, and it was about 200,000 roughly. So here the king, he's got a 1,000 of his lords, and they drank wine in the presence of the 1,000. So he's up, there, he's up there taste testing his wine. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, which I've told you is not actually his father, it's his actually great, great grandfather. You know, when, you, when you're a father, you're, you know, that's a wonderful thing. But, but when you get real good at being a father, then you become a grandfather, right? And then if, a little while later, if you keep living, you get real good at it, and they call you a great grandfather. Well, this is his great grandfather, all right. And 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 uh, Nebuchadnezzar, his 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 father, Nebuchadnezzar, his ancestor, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. Um, all right, so we're going to think about what's about to happen this way because it's going to seem drastic for what he did. What happens to him is going to seem drastic for this little thing that you're going you're about to hear about. But I want you to know why it was so drastic, because what's happening here is Belshazzar is taking the vessels of God that, are, that came from the temple of Jerusalem. Those are God's vessels. Those have been sanctified to God. They belong to God. And Belshazzar is gonna take them and use them for himself. So the, the sin here is to take something that belongs to God and use it for yourself. Right, all right, so here we go. Anyway, that the king and, the Lord, and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which has been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now, let me just mention this because you'll see this a little bit later. Daniel is not in the room. Daniel is the great prophet of God who told Nebuchadnezzar everything that God was gonna do. He was, he was made high in the kingdom, and he, but he's not in the room at this time. And you just need to know this, because uh, that little description right there, you, you'll see in, in, in a minute uh, how amazing this thing is. Verse five, in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand, 
on the plaster on the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed. Yeah, I bet it did. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. I mean, God really freaked him out is what really... I mean, he is really freaked out. As a matter of fact, I looked, I tried to find the phrase, knees knocked together. I tried to find that phrase in other literature of the day. But the Bible is the only book I found, and you might could find some, go, you know, Google and all that, that where the phrase, his knees knocked together, was actually used uh, before this. So God just freaks old Belshazzar out. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. This is why I told you about Nebuchadnezzar and, and Nabonidus, his dad. He, the reason he would be the third is because uh, Belshazzar's the second. Yeah. Uh, Nabonidus is the king, his daddy. He's the second, and the interpreter of this can be third, all right? So that's what he's promising. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. It's going to be a bad night, Belshazzar, I'm telling you right now. You ain't going to like it. The queen, now... The queen is actually his mama. This is, the queen. This is Nabonidus' wife. She's the queen. So this is Belshazzar's mama. The queen, uh, and remember, she's the, she's the great granddaughter, I mean, she's the granddaughter of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So she was around when all that stuff, went, when Nebuchadnezzar went on. She was his granddaughter, just like I have grandchildren, you have grandchildren. They were there when all that stuff was happening. Now she's the queen. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, she kind of hears what's going on, came to the banquet hall. So she wasn't at the meeting before this, but she comes down there because she hears them all freaking out. The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. The reason that queens say that is because they're always in jeopardy. Yeah. Queens are always in jeopardy. They, 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 the king could say, off with your head, yeah. and that'd be it. So the queen's always trying to make the king happy so she doesn't have to get her head cut off. All right. So anyway, O king, live forever. Now remember, this is her son, so it's kind of freaky, but all right. <laughs> Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. Now she's talking about Daniel. And in the days of your father... Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, all right, King Nebuchadnezzar, your great-grandfather, and then, and your father, the king, Nabonidus. So that's two different people. That he didn't just, she didn't just stutter and say that over again. Made him, so see what, what, what she's telling Belshazzar is, look, your great-grandfather Nebuchadnezzar and your daddy did this. So don't get mad at me. This is, this is what they did. They did this. She's just trying to kind of cover her bases, all right? Made him chief of the magic, magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. And as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, how would you like this to be your resume? An excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas. You know what an enigma is, right? Something that's difficult to explain and difficult to understand. That's what an enigma is. But he, they're not for Daniel. Daniel can explain enigmas, man. I mean, he's just wonderful. We're found in, I like the way, this Daniel. Okay, now he's this Daniel. This boy right here, this Daniel. All right. Daniel, whom the king named Belt, Belteshazzar. Now, this is it. It's, it's interesting, if nothing else, all right? You notice the, 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 you notice the, the uh, uh, correspondence or the uh, similarities, word I'm looking for, yeah. 
similarity between Belteshazzar and Belshazzar. All right, now, Nebuchadnezzar named Daniel Belteshazzar. Nabonidus named his boy Belshazzar. Remember, Nabonidus loved the moon god, Sin, and he went around building temples to Sin all over the kingdom, so he was never at home. So, Bel, the word, the little prefix Bel, B-E-L, means God. So, in the Babylonian society, they had many gods, many gods, but the king was the main god. He was the highest God of all gods, and nobody could be worshiped over the king. So Nabonidus names his son Belshazzar, which means protector of the king, so that he could go out into the kingdom everywhere and do his own thing and leave, and leave Belshazzar in charge, and Belshazzar would protect the king and keep the kingdom safe and be, his, be, the, be the protector of the king, and he could feel comfortable doing that. That's why he named him Belshazzar. Belteshazzar means protector of the king's wife. Nebuchadnezzar named Daniel protector of the king's wife because the queen was always in jeopardy. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that during the time of Daniel that there were gonna be queens, wives of kings, that would need to be kept safe. And so Nebuchadnezzar names Daniel the protector of the queen's wife. And, and so Belshazzar's mother, the queen, feels quite comfortable bringing Daniel into the situation because Daniel is actually her protector. And she's wanting him to know that. She's wanting her son to know, hey, this guy you're bringing in is Belteshazzar. You're, Nebuchadnezzar named him Belteshazzar. And then, of course, they didn't have to be interpreted to him. He knew the name immediately meant protector of the, of the king's wife. So that's saying to him in a subtle way, uh, don't try to do anything to mama here because, uh, you know, Daniel's, he, he, all this stuff's true about him and he's been assigned to be the protector of the queen's wife. All right, so here we go. Now let Daniel be called, end of verse 12. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel? Now he's that Daniel, he was this Daniel, now he's that Daniel. Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah? Now he's basically just telling Daniel, don't forget who you are. Don't forget you're a captive. Don't get too smart. I'm the king, you're a slave. I just want to remind you of that. I, I think, to be honest, Belshazzar was intimidated by Daniel and just a little, and just a little bit afraid of him. That's what I think. But anyway, are you that Daniel whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you. Okay, so he's, he's telling now, okay, I've heard what happened with you. I've heard all about the stuff and all that. Okay, now that's important because it goes with what I'm going to say to you later. I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men and the astrologers have been brought before, have been brought in before me that they should read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So there's the, there's the provision. That's the reward. Notice what Daniel said in verse 17. Now, let me just mention this to you. Daniel has not been in the room yet and he has not seen the writing yet. So the king has just met with him and said, here's what I'm gonna do for you. Daniel has not seen what was written on that wall yet. So here's what he says to him. He says, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. So Daniel refuses the, 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 pay, the payment. All right, just keep that in mind. 
And remember, he, wasn't, he, he hadn't read it yet. Verse 18. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed, him, they fed him with grass like an oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints it over, over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. Daniel said, you knew it. You knew, what, you knew all that. And yet you have not humbled your heart. You're just as proud as, as, you, as your great granddaddy was. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of the house before you and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now, I just, I called your attention to the fact that's, that's the phrase that was used earlier, right? That they worship the gods of gold and silver, wood and uh, uh, iron and, and what is it? Uh, anyway, you, it, they worship iron and gold and, 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 and wood and stubble. All right. The, what I want you to see is Daniel wasn't in the room, but he knew that. That, that's an amazing, he, just, he knew it and he said it to him. Um, let me get on the right page, here we go. Let me see. All right, which do not see, see you've praised gods which do not see, they do not hear and they do not know and the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you've not glorified. In other words, you've glorified gods of, of, of gold and silver and wood and iron and clay. You've, you've glorified them and they can't hear and they can't think and they can't see. They can't. And yet the God who holds your life and everything about you and all of your kingdom and success, you've not glorified him. You've actually stolen his stuff and used it for yourself. <laughs> this is the interpretation. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and this writing was written. That was a tipping point, wasn't it? When he used stuff that belonged to God for himself, that was a tipping point, right? I mean, God said, that's it. That, 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 that's it. You know what a tipping point is, right? A tipping point is when you add one more drop, it tips. It means you can't, it means, it means you're right on the verge of tipping and the last little drop drops in it and it, and it tips. Beyond redemption point is a, is a tipping point. This, this event was a tipping point for God. And when, and when he did it, uh, here's what God did. And this is the inscription that was written. Meeny, meeny, tikel, you farson. This is the interpretation of each word. Meeny, means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Your number's up. You've heard that? There you go. That's where it came from. God has numbered your kingdom and he's finished it. You're finished, Belshazzar. Tekel, which comes from the word shekel, which means a weight of monetary value. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and you've been found wanting. Perez, which is the Hebrew version of Eupharson, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The, the silver chest and arms on that statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. The Medes and the Persians are going to get your kingdom. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. 
I thought him, I thought he told him, I don't want that. Give it to somebody else. Why is he taking it now? Well, I told you before when he said that he didn't want it, he, he hadn't seen the writing on the wall. He didn't know what God said. So he said, man, don't worry. I, I don't want to be third ruler. When he came in there and read that writing on the wall, he said, uh-oh, Belshazzar's through, and I better get myself into a high position or I'm going to be in trouble around here. And he said, give me, I'm going to be third ruler. Give me that thing, man. I'm gonna, you know, God's fixing to do some bad stuff, and I want to make sure I'm here for the next kingdom that comes in. That's what he's basically doing. That very night, verse 30, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Darius the Mede, by the way, we'll look at next week. He's the one that puts Daniel in the line then. It, it's an interesting thing. All right, so what should we talk about? Uh, <laughs> all right, let's talk about the stubbornness of pride, all right? Let's talk about, let's talk about where stubbornness comes from and how we can deal with it. All right, I, I've given you, if you look on your outline, three characteristics, three characteristics of prideful stubbornness. If, you, if this describes you, then you got some business you need to do with God concerning pride, all right? Pride's terrible, it's destructive. All right, here's number one, number one. We're talking about Belshazzar, but, but you could put your name in there. Just take he out and put your name in there. He saw but he didn't look. Now, I know that sounds backwards. Most times you say he looked, but he didn't see. I'm saying he saw, but he didn't look. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, what in the world would you even be talking about that? All right, I'm going to show you an incident from the life of Moses. And you'll see what I'm talking about. He saw, but he didn't look. This is from Exodus 3, verses 1 through 4. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw, he turned aside to look. God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, hey, Moses. He said, I, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> when God saw that Moses turned aside from what he saw coming across the desert, he sees a bush on fire. Man, a bush is on fire. Well, that's not really all that unusual in the desert, co uh, spontaneous combustion and such. But what was strange about it was it didn't burn up. As he was watching it traveling along, it just kept on burning and it didn't burn up. And so what he had seen at a distance and what, he had, what had captivated his attention now he turns aside and he goes over and he looks at what had, what had attracted him. So Moses not only saw, Moses turned aside and looked. He was attracted by what he saw. And he turned aside and he examined what he was being shown by God. And this allowed God to speak to him and to guide him and to enrich his life and give him direction. Growing up in the family of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar saw and heard of all these great encounters that his, that his great grandfather had had with God. And although he, he saw him, he, he never looked for God for himself. 
In other words, he saw a lot of events going on that had something called God attached to it, but he was never inquisitive enough. He was never curious enough. He was never, he was never uh, determined enough to go and take a look personally. He saw it, oh yeah, at a distance, but he didn't go take a look personally and consider the fact that that God that was doing all of those great things with Nebuchadnezzar might have something he wants to do with him. This whole incident in Daniel chapter 5 starts with Belshazzar bringing the vessels from the temple of God and using them for himself. So what we're dealing with here is misuse of God's uh, gifts, God's, of God's property. These vessels belong to God. Well, is there any correlation in our life of anything that you can think of that belongs to God that we might be using for ourselves? All right, what about tithes? I mean, that's just one of them. I'm not going to preach on tithing. I'm just bringing it up because it's easy to see. What does the Bible say about tithes? They belong to God. 10%, which is what the word means, bring it into the storehouse. As a matter of fact, put that verse up on screen, Malachi 3.10. Now, I'm not preaching on tithing, so relax, okay? I'm using it as an example because it's just so easy to see. All right, God said, bring the tithe, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Is there anything confusing about that? That's not hard to understand, right? Nobody misunderstands what that's saying that there may be food in my house and try me, says the Lord, and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. All right, so there's no really, you know, there's no really question about what God's saying, but some, some people say, well, that's the Old Testament, preacher. That's, that's what they say, because they don't want to do it. So they say, well, we live in the New Testament now, that's the Old Testament. Well, what if I showed you where Jesus actually said this? Would that be good enough for you? Not only in the New Testament, but that Jesus actually said it. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. Notice the next line. These you ought to have done without leaving any of the others undone. What I'm, saying, what I'm seeing Jesus said is you tithed on your mint and it ought to be done. And you tithed on your cumin and it ought to be done. And, and not a niece, whatever that is, you tithed on that too. And, I, and, I, and that should have been done. Jesus didn't say, hey man, forget about that. That's the Old Testament. Forget about that tithing mess. No, Jesus said you, sh you should have done that. So, hey, come on away from that. It belongs to God, and if you use it, you're using something that belongs to God for yourself, is all I'm saying to you. Now, I have tithed all my life. I, have, I tithed when I wasn't even saved. And I know for 50 years of my life that God has blessed my life because of it. I really believe this. And so I'm very strong in the tithing category. This is a strong suit in my life. I've done this all my life. So it's a strong suit in my life. Maybe it's not a strong suit in your life. Maybe you struggle with it. Maybe it's something that's difficult for you to want to do and grasp and you don't think it really means that and you're trying to find some way around it and, and all that kind of stuff because you can't figure out why God would need it and all that kind of stuff. And it's a weakness in your life. And you just keep wrestling with it and you need the Holy Spirit to talk to you about it and say something to you. So, although my weakness is not tithing, I do have some things I struggle with. None of us are perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So, it might not be tithing, but I have something that I wrestle with in my life. And you may be strong in what I'm weak, and you, you know, and, I'm, and, and weak where I'm strong, so, but none of us, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And that's why... I never consider when I preach a message that I'm preaching it to y'all. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I always 
view it as preaching it to us. Because when God gives me a, a word or a, a direction to go or an interest, in some way he guides me on, on what to preach about, I never look at that as, okay, God, you're going to really blast them today, aren't you? I mean, you're going, oh, oh, this is, this is. No, I consider it a message for all of us. Because we all have things we struggle in, right? All right, let me phrase that another way for you. We all have things that we are stubborn about. Stubbornness will close your eyes to the things that you need to examine in your life. You will see them, but you will not look at them. You will see them, but you will not examine them. You will not be curious about them. I have had people in the churches I have pastored for 42 years, is that how many years? Yeah. For something. Yeah. That have loved every message that I have ever preached on tithing. They will sit there and say, amen, glory to God, that's right, preacher, preach on, whoa, and just be so pumped up about it and they still give $5 a week. They see, but they don't look. I mean, it's good for everybody else, but, but I mean, as far as I go, you know, that was Belshazzar's problem. It was good for Nebuchadnezzar. I see what God did. But for me, personally, I mean, I don't see how that relates to me whatsoever. You know, this is, and this is pride that does this. Pride creates a stubbornness in us that won't let us look at ourselves or examine things or even be curious, even be curious about some stuff. I'm telling you, if I was sitting in the, in, a, in the pews in a church and, 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 and my preacher was preaching and, and something popped up in my mind, I'd write it down on a piece of paper and then when I got home, man, I'd start studying. I'd, I'd look for that. I'd be curious about that. What does that mean? What is this going on? What, man, people don't, they, they just hear and they walk out and they, you know, where you want to go to eat today? Oh, right, yeah. No curiosity, no nothing. What happens with that? Stubbornness. Just, you know... I don't need to do this. It's not important. Do you know how you conquer stubbornness like this? I can give you one word, intimacy. You know what intimacy is? Intimacy means into me see. Intimacy will break this stubborn pride. I mean, intimacy says, I'm giving you permission to see into me. Now, can you imagine what would happen if you got in a small group of Christians somewhere that you really believed in and you believe they love you and you allowed them to see into you? What do you think would happen in your life? Would it help you? Would it affect you? This is one reason I, I, I love our recharge. I'm serious. I, everybody that comes to it, we have about... 13 to 15 people that come to recharge generally. And I, I know every one of them. I know their weaknesses. I know what, what bothers them. I know what they pray about. I know everything about their life almost. You know, maybe a few things they hadn't said, but it'd be very few because they'll talk about anything. That's intimacy. And so if, if, if God wants to use me to say something to them about whatever it is, I mean, that's the perfect opportunity, man. I mean, God's just got you right there and it's like, and, and then you receive it and you hear it and you're not mad and you're not torn up and you're not fussing. That, that's intimacy. Intimacy allows this to happen. And, and, and so you get in, in a group. You, but you know why people won't get in a group like that? Because here's what they think. If I go into a group like that and I start talking about my life, they're going to think that I am a horrible person. Well, may I tell you that they're not going to think that you're a horrible person? You want me to tell you what they are thinking? They're thinking, my goodness, man, don't tell me there's somebody as bad as I am in this world. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. 
is intimacy. And our, that, that's what Hebrews 4 means, come to the throne of grace. I've already preached a message on that, so you don't need to hear it again. Let's go to the second thing. All right. He heard, but he didn't listen. He saw, but he didn't look. And now I'm saying he heard, but, but, he, did, but he didn't listen. You know that Belshazzar heard all those things that happened to his great-grandfather, right? I mean, you know they talked about it around the house. They talked about Daniel interpreting the dream and how wonderful that was, and man, unbelievable. They talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and that fiery furnace, and how great that miracle was. They talk about Nebuchadnezzar turning into a wild animal, running out in the woods, being out there for seven years until he finally, God finally let him go and healed him and rescued him and all that. And then Nebuchadnezzar had all these tremendously great words about how I extol thee and I lift thee and you're the greatest and you're the most wonderful. You know Belshazzar heard all of that. Well, why didn't it affect him? If he heard it all, why didn't it affect him? Same reason that a lot of stuff doesn't affect you. A lot of stuff your wife says, men, don't affect you. A lot of stuff you say to her doesn't affect her. And certainly there are a lot of parents that say a lot of things to their kids that don't affect them. And, and, and there are times where you have to just let what they say go too because uh, you can't, you know, you don't want to kill them. How many times have you, have, have, all right, let me talk to the guys, and women, ladies, you just put yourself into these with the pronouns. I'm talking to, to, I'll talk to the men, but I mean everybody. How many times, men, has your wife said to you, pick up your clothes and put them in a clothes basket? or the hamper, depending on how sophisticated you are. I had a husband tell me one time, seriously, this is what he said, that his wife would pick up his underwear and hold it up and say, are these yours? And he would say, yes, they're mine. And she would fling them at him to put, in, put them in the clothes basket. And he said, that made him so mad. He said, that, he said, what it did, it made me so mad, I determined I was never going to pick up my underwear. I just put them on the floor and just let them go. I don't care. and Walk on them. Because he said, she could have just asked me, pick up your underwear and put them in the basket. She probably did a thousand times. But no, she had to get sarcastic about it. She had to insult me. So I'm just, they ain't picking them up. And so he said, over the next few times she asked him, he, he finally got smart out about it. And he said, when she held his underwear up and she said, are these yours? And he said, I hope they are because if they're not, I got some questions of my own. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, that's called stubbornness. Yeah. All right, you hear... Why do you do that? You heard her say it. You certainly knew what it meant. And why didn't you do it? Well, you heard it, but you didn't listen to it. Have you, have you ever talked to somebody and when you're talking to them, they're talking to you and then you start saying something and then they get all flustered about it because what do they say to you? You're not listening to me. You're hearing the words come out of my mouth. Listen to my heart. Hear what, what I'm, hear what I'm really saying. Hear what's coming out of me. Stubbornness won't allow that. No, no, no. Uh, don't confuse me with any facts or any emotions or anything like that. My mind's already made up about it. So Belshazzar, he heard, but he didn't listen. Let me just give this last one this real quick. All right, number three. These are characteristics now of prideful stubbornness. If you see them, if you see them, uh, come on, deal with it. He knew, <clears throat> but he didn't learn. <clears throat> he knew all about it. <clears throat> he knew all the facts about it. 
He knew all the evidence. He had all the evidence. <clears throat> he knew what had happened to his family. He knew all of the dynamics of everything that went on, but he didn't learn from it. What, what, what's the deal here? Well, the deal is the same thing that happens in our lives. It's easy for us to, to know about the Lord. It's easy for us to know about the Word and what it says about Jesus and what it says we must do in order to be saved and to belong to Jesus. We have all the evidence. We have read it. We know it. We, we know what it says. But the problem comes in that our will has not been turned toward God. Do you know what strong-willed means? Strong-willed is a word we use, Christians especially, because we don't want to put a curse on our children by calling them stubborn. Strong will means you're just stubborn. And we don't want that to become you know, their middle name, so we call them strong will because it sounds better. To be strong-willed means I turn my will toward myself rather than God. In other words, to be strong-willed is I decide what happens in my life, not God or not my parents. And I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care what you say about it. Are you going to make me do this? Because you're going to have to, because I'm not going to do it unless you're willing to make me do it. That's strong-willed. And I'm saying that many, many people know everything about what they should do with God, and maybe even when they were young, they came down an aisle and they said to a pastor, Pastor, I love Jesus and I, I want Jesus to be in my life. And the pastor said, well, if you'll pray this prayer with me and you really mean it in your heart, then God will save your soul. And the sweet little things say it and they mean it so deeply. You meant it. Tanya came to the Lord, how were you, nine years old? A little less than that or maybe nine? Eleven. How, how did I forget that? Eleven. Maybe it's because we've, we've done so many other things all this time. We didn't let it go. I didn't let it go. I came to the Lord when I was 16. <clears throat> of course, when you're 16, you kind of you know, you know what your life is at 16. At 11, I mean, what do you really have to repent of? I mean, come on. I mean, what did you do? Steal a cookie or something, you know? You, that's about it. You, you know, you, you went nah, 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 to your mama or something, you know, behind the door. I mean, what, what do you really have to, to be repentant about when you're 11 years old? You just have a tender heart and you love God. All right, so you surrender right there. But there's going to come a point that even though you surrendered right there, where your will is going to have to be broken. Even though you've prayed, you've said all the words, you've done all the things that you need to do. You're going to get to be a teenager and you ain't going to want to obey God. And that's when the decision is made in your life. Or you might make it on through your teenage years. You might be a young adult. But somewhere along the way, you're going to have to turn your will toward God in order to be his, to be controlled by him. Now, I'm just saying that a lot, a lot, a lot of people have come and said the right words and, and maybe even at the moment meant what they were saying at the moment. But they have not turned their will to God. I know it's mighty late, y'all. Forgive me. But this thing we prayed about yet that Tanya's mentioned about it was happened with one of our granddaughters, and um, it you know we still got some evidence to live through. But but right now it looks like a, a real victory. But you know what that was? 
that was one of our sweet granddaughters that loved God with all of her heart and just was a precious child and gentle, sweet, loving, so giving and gracious. And as a little child, she came. I baptized her three times, I know. I, every time we'd baptize, she'd say, Papa, will you baptize me again? You know, just every time she, we had baptism, she wanted to get in the water and get baptized. And I did it, you know. I mean, what's it gonna hurt? And anyway, um, but as she became, you know, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 years old, because of a lot of issues in life like we all face when we get that old and age and, and, and stuff, and especially with divided families and different things like that, there are lots of things. Hey, she did not turn her will toward God. She turned her will toward herself. She was cold, indifferent, non-responsive, unconcerned, you might as well be talking to that wall. That's, you know what that shows? Your will's not turned to God. When you turn your will to God, your life opens up. When you turn your will to God, you're a different person. Let me tell you the difference. I just described the way it was for a year or something like that. Maybe more. Three years. Three years. See, I'm terrible with time. Three years. Yesterday, we walked up, and, and, and as soon as she saw us, she ran down those stairs and just hugged and, hugged and just was so excited and, and full of life and, and just hugged us. And, and she had made other moves with, with her parents and so forth, and that expressed the fact that something dynamically, something dynamic had happened in her life. And you know what it was? She turned her will toward God. And when you turn your will toward God, that's when your life changes. And that's when all of a sudden, things are different in your life. You're open, you're transparent, you're kind, you're, you're a gracious person, you're humble. Uh, your whole life changes. It just changes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Never the same. Now that's what you need in life. That's what, what it's all about. Pride will keep you from this. Pride will say, you all right like you are. Mm -hmm. Don't, no, oh, no, you don't do that. No, no, that's embarrassing. You, you've been saying you're a Christian all this time and now you're going to do something like that? What to her? Pride will kill you. See, the devil doesn't care what it is that messes you up just so you get messed up. And pride will do it for you. All right, let's bow our heads.